Okay, students. So this is lecture two, lecture two, um, thermodynamics and electrochemistry. Uh, from the last time, we were discussing how you could calculate work done by a chemical system or to calculate work for a chemical system. Okay, let me just get my laser pointer here. So let's consider the system where you have propane being oxidized or you could say being burnt to produce carbon dioxide which is a gas under normal conditions room temperature conditions and water All right of course water is a liquid now the work done is given is given by uh, minus p delta v minus P, where P is the pressure, PEX means external pressure, times the change in volume. So that's how you would calculate the work done by the system. All right? Work is equal to minus P delta V. Now, you might be looking at this equation and be saying, or be asking yourselves, how is it that you could calculate work done on or by such a system? How is it possible? You don't have volume values and you don't have a pressure value well you could actually calculate the work easily by assuming that the gases behave ideally and working with atmospheric pressure atmospheric pressure is one atmospheres or 101325 pascals as given here okay of course after that you'll be asking now what how would i get the volume values well you could use the ideal gas theory to calculate the, the volume values. However, there's an easier way. There's a much simpler way to work with an equation in calculating work. And that's what we want to deal with. Now, look at the equation. All right? You have one mole of propane gas reacting with five moles of oxygen gas to produce three moles of carbon dioxide gas and four moles of water. The first thing you have to note is that in a chemical reaction, only gases are able to do work. That's the first thing. Liquids or solids are not able to do work, only gases. The next thing you have to think about is this expression. It says P, it says work is equal to minus P delta V. Now that looks similar to something, the ideal gas equation, which is PV is equal to NRT, right? Of course, if you put a delta or you look at a change in one parameter on the left-hand side, then you have to look at a change in another parameter on the right-hand side in order for this thing to continue to be an equation. So if you have PV is equal to NRT, and all of a sudden you decide to look at P delta V on the left-hand side, then you have to look at a change in something else on the right-hand side. So P delta V could be equal to delta NRT. Okay, delta N, all right? A matter of fact, let's go back to the ideal gas equation. P is the pressure, V is the volume, N is the number of moles, R is the universal gas constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. Now, like I said earlier, if you're looking at a change in some parameter on the left-hand side, for example, a change in the volume, you have to look at a change in another parameter, or that should be equal to another parameter being changed on the right-hand side. For example, the number of moles. Now, how does this work? How does this work in helping you to calculate work based on a chemical equation? Now, PV is equal to NRT. P delta V is equal to delta NRT. What this means is that wherever you have P delta V, you could replace that with delta NRT. For example, in this equation, you have P delta V. Replace the P delta V with delta NRT. So the work done by this system can be calculated by 
minus delta n r t as shown here. But what is delta n? Delta n is just a change in the number of moles of gaseous products and the number of moles of gaseous reactants. That is, what is the no look if you look at this equation, what number of moles of gaseous products you have? Gaseous products, don't forget that part. Well, you have three moles of carbon dioxide gas. And on the reactant side, you, only, you have one mole of gas of propane, which is a gas, and five moles of oxygen. So that's total six moles of gas on the reactant side. So it, it, to calculate delta N, it will be three, which is the number of moles of gaseous products, or product in this case, minus six, which is the total number of moles of gaseous reactants. So you'll have three minus six in order to get delta N. Hence the formula. When you plug everything into the formula, what you have here is work is equal to minus 3 minus 6 moles times 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole, which is the universal gas constant, times 298 Kelvin, which is equal now to 7432.72 joules. That is the work done by uh, done um, in such a system. Now, we have to be careful. We have to be very careful of what we say here. Look at the, the work. The work is positive, indicating to us that work was done on the system and not by the system. Okay? The fact that the value of work is positive indicates that work was done on the system and not by the system. Now, you could have figured this out by just inspecting the equation. The fact that you are producing a smaller number of moles of gas than you started out with, right? What you are having is a compression. It's, a, it's, where it's basically a compression. Okay? It's almost like, it's almost like starting out with a balloon um, that has a lot of gas in it. And so the balloon is very hard, very stiff. However, after some amount of time, the amount of gas in the balloon decreases. And so the balloon becomes very placid, very soft. Okay? So it, it, it's, it's similar to that. Not exactly the same, but it is similar. Okay? So work is done on the system. Work is done on the system. If, if the value of work is positive or if the value of work is negative, work is done by the system. Okay? In this case, it is positive, indicating that work was done on the system. I must also point out to you that you should always ensure that you keep your negative sign on the formula. It's a part of the formula. All right? We will speak more about work as we, as we go further into the lecture and other lectures. Now, let's look at a PV, PV curves. Let's talk about PV curves, pressure volume curves. All right? Now, pressure volume curves, as the name suggests, is just a plot of pressure versus volume. Now, I'm going to tell you straight off the bat that the area beneath a pressure volume curve is equal to the work. That's what it is equal to. Now, this might not look like much of a curve, and by, by this, I'm talking about this blue line here. Okay? Let's say you have a system where the pressure is fixed, all right? So the pressure is constant, whereas the volume is changing from VI to V final or VI to VF. The area underneath this curve is equal to the work. Now, if you look at this diagram here, it looks like a rectangle. How do you calculate the area of a rectangle? It is side times side. So the length of one side times are multiplied by the length of, an, of the other side. The length of this side is P. PEX, if you want to call that, the external pressure. Whereas the length of this side is VF minus VI. 
right? So it is the same thing as the formula for work. So work, we know, is equal to minus PEX times VF, mi um, VF minus VI. So the work done, what we have done here is to prove that the work, the work is equal to the area beneath a PV curve. Okay? Look at, the, look at the yellow region. How do you calculate the area of the yellow region? The yellow region is the area underneath the curve. The curve is the blue line. All right, this side has a length of PEX, whereas this side has a length of F final minus F initial. Okay, so you have to say F final minus F initial to get the length of this side. And multiply it by PEX in order to get the area underneath the curve. By convention, we generally put a minus sign. That is a given. Right? It's not something you need to figure out. Okay? And so what you find is that work, the formula for work, happens to be the same thing. PEX times delta V. This is basically proof that the area beneath a PV diagram or a PV curve, right, is equal to the work. Right? It's equal to the work. Now, that was a case where the pressure was fixed. What about a situation where the pressure is changing and also the volume is changing? What will, it, what, what, what will you do? What will you need to do? Well, if the pressure is changing and the volume is also changing, then you'll end up, you, you'll end up with a curve like this one. Okay? It's not, it's not a nice and regular shape like a square or a rectangle. That you can easily work with. It's more irregular. Such a PV curve, you would need to use a bit of integration. Now, I'm not going to pressure you to show the integration, but what you will need to know more than anything is how, how to work with such a system. How to work with a system where the pressure is changing and the volume is also changing at the same time. Now, first thing is first. Work is equal to minus PDV. Here it is. All right, work is equal to minus PDV. Don't, don't look at the integration sign yet. Integration sign here is just saying that you are integrating between the limits of V final and V initial. All right? Now, remember that the ideal gas equation says that PV, PV is equal to NRT. If you take this formula and make P the subject, then this is what you will get. P is equal to NRT. All right, I'm sure you can agree with that. So what you do in this formula here, remove P, right? Remove P and put NRT over V right here in this formula. Once you do that, then you can end up down here. Now what I have done is basically to put N, R, and T in front of the integration sign and to leave behind the integration sign dv and also v. Okay, dv and also v is left behind the integration sign. Okay, now upon integration of this expression, you will end up with work being equal to minus nrt ln V final over V initial. Do not forget, try not to forget the ln, the natural log. So work is equal to minus NRT ln V final over V initial. Right? So if you have the two, if you have the final volume and the initial volume, and you also know the number of moles of gas and also the temperature, you can easily calculate the work. Okay? Of course, you might be wondering, okay, but um, what if I don't have the volume? What if I don't have the volume values? What if I'm given the pressure values? The pressure values. No problem. No problem. You can use this formula. Work is equal to minus NRT ln P initial over P final. And you'll realize something strange. In the case where you had the volume values, it was V final over V initial. However, in the case of, in the case where you have the 
pressure values, it is P initial over P final. Why is that? And that, 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 that should be a question in your mind now. Why is that? Well, remember volume and pressure shares an inverse relationship. All right, according to Boyle's law. Okay, according to Boyle's law, vol volume and pressure share an inverse relationship for a fixed mass of gas at a fixed temperature. Okay? Then somebody asks you that, asks you to calculate the work, uh, calculate the work for an ideal gas, three moles of an ideal gas at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay? When the volume is constant, but the pressure changes from, let's say, one um, pascals to three pascals. Then you'll use this one. Okay? All right. That's how you calculate your work. Now, pressing on a little bit further, we want to calculate the change in the internal energy. We want to calculate the change in the internal energy. And according to the first law of thermodynamics, delta U, which is the change in the internal energy, is equal to Q plus W. All right? Which basically comes down to Q plus minus delta NRT, because W can be calculated from minus delta NRT, right? W can also be calculated from minus PDV. Okay, just to write, that was just, you know, recap. Now, we calculated the work just now. Here is it. Here, here, here is the work. Uh, where, where is that? Here it is. We calculated the work. Okay, and the work is positive. Here it is. 7,432.72 joules. If Q is given to you as minus 2,220 kilojoules, which works out to be minus 2,000 220 times 10 to the 3 joules, then you could calculate delta U. Delta U is just Q plus W. Q, this is Q, plus W. And this is the delta U. Note that both Q and W are of the same units. Joules, not kilojoules. You can't have one of them in kilojoules and the other one in joules. That is why I converted Q over here from kilojoules to joules. Both of them must be in joules, as you'll have problems. So if you have both of them in joules, things will work out. If at the end of the day you want to calculate, or you want to convert, I should say, one, uh, calculate, um, should say convert the answer. If you want to convert the answer at the end of the day to kilojoules, no problem. That's all right. That's what I did here. After working out in joules, I got a number and I converted back to kilojoules. That's not a problem. Okay? Now look at the value of the internal energy that was calculated. It is minus 2,212.56 kilojoules. Clearly, the internal energy has increased. Internal energy change is towards an increase. Because minus 2,000, minus 2,212, all right, is a bigger number than this number here, minus 2,220. What that tells us is that when work is done on the system, the internal energy increases, all right? So because work was done on the system, here's the work that was done on the system, it is 7,432.72 joules. Because work was done on the system, there's an increase in the internal energy. All right? In other words, it had a positive effect on the internal energy. All right? Okay. Now, uh, however, the internal energy change is still negative internal energy change is still negative. And so if you're asked to, to, to draw energy profile diagram for this reaction, combustion of propane, what you will end up with is something like this. Because the internal energy change is still negative, what it means is that the final internal energy, 
is less than the initial internal energy, such that when you say final minus initial, you will end up with a negative value. All right? So let's say it again. The fact that the internal energy change is negative indicates to us that the internal energies of the products is less than that of the reactants, such that when you say final minus initial, the result must be negative. All right? And this is the energy profile diagram. Internal energy of products are lower than the internal energies of the reactants. So that when you say final minus initial, you end up with a negative value. Okay? All right. Now, there are a number of useful examples of reactions that can do work that we make use of. Some of them produce heat energy that we also make use of. And the same example that we were looking at, propane. We burn propane in our gas stoves to cook our food. All right? Um, uh, this is another useful one, the combustion of octane in internal combustion engines, which we use to drive our motor vehicles. A lot of heat is produced, 5,461 kilojoules per mole of propane, not propane, um, octane. Um, another famous one is metabolism, where glucose is oxidizing the mitochondria of cells, and we produce typically um, 2,800 kilojoules per mole of glucose. Uh, another popular one is the ammonium nitrate reaction. Ammonium nitrate um, is very explosive. A matter of fact, maybe you would have heard about the explosion in Beirut recently, and where that entire city was almost wiped out as a result of an ammonia an ammonium nitrate explosion. Um, this reaction does a lot of work. Why? Because you start out with a solid, and at the end of the reaction, you produce a lot of gases, a lot of nitrogen gas and also oxygen gas and some water. So heat is released, but there's also a lot of work, W. There's also a lot of work done. All right? This other reaction is quite interesting. This is where sodium azide, sodium azide, which is used in airbags in cars, Right? Once there's an impact, the car produces a spark in the airbag. That spark will cause sodium azide to decompose rapidly to produce sodium solid. Okay? The sodium solid could be could cause a flame. So generally the the airbags contain something that will mop up the sodium. And also nitrogen gas is produced. The nitrogen gas is what inflates the airbag. Okay? Some heat is produced. And the work that is produced is done by the gas which inflates the airbag. The airbag. Uh, another useful pair of reactions is the reaction that occurs in your lead acid batteries in your cars, or let's say in most cars, because most cars still use lead acid batteries. Okay? And this is, these are the two reactions the anodic and the cathodic reactions. Now, how do we determine um, internal energy change experimentally? Now, this is important. How do we determine internal energy change experimentally? Internal energy change delta U, we know is equal to Q plus W. Okay? However, W, W, is, can, well, it can be represented by minus P delta V, or PDV, okay? However, what if the volume could not change? Because remember, delta V means change, and DV means change. What if you could conduct the reaction in a vessel where the volume could not change? That is, delta V or DV is equal to zero. If you could do that, then delta U would be equal to just Q, because zero, if zero times... 0 times P is 0. So if dV is 0, because you're doing the reaction in a vessel where the volume cannot change, then this entire part of the equation becomes 0. And so delta U is equal to Q. Q 
2 is the heat. Q, we know, is given by C delta T, where C is the heat capacity, delta T is the change in temperature. All right? Therefore, if delta U is equal to Q, but Q is equal to C delta T, all right? then delta U is equal to C delta T. Now you probably wonder, hey, what is that little subscript V that you have there? That subscript V means constant volume. Now, there's a device called a bomb calorimeter in which you could carry out this um, experiment. Right? This device is made up of three main parts. The calorimeter cup, which is, which is a shine looking bucket here. The bomb, which is this metal device here. And the water jacket. The bomb is a is a thick walled steel device which does not allow any change in volume hence dv is equal to zero if dv is equal to zero any change in the internal energy is manifested in a change in the heat or it's a, it's manifested as a, as a as a heat change okay right so let's say you give me, let's say you have a piece of bread, all right? And you come to me with a piece of bread and you say, look, I want you to determine the amount of energy inside this piece of bread. The amount of energy inside the piece of bread is called the internal energy. That energy exists in two main forms, heat and work. Okay. If you come to me with that piece of bread, I will burn it in a bomb calorimeter. Why? The bomb calorimeter will cause the work component to be equal to zero. So there's no work. The bread can't do any work inside the bomb calorimeter. Why? Because the bomb calorimeter, the walls of the, of the bomb are so thick that there can be no change in volume. And because there can be no change in volume, then the gases produced from this bread will not be able to do work. All right. So... The internal energy is manifested in the form of Q. Q is heat. Now, how can I evaluate Q? If I know the heat capacity or the constant volume heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter, all I need to do then is to measure the change in temperature of the water jacket. And then I have a thermometer. Once I know the change in temperature of the thermometer, are well indicated by the thermometer, I should say. Then, I just multiply that by the constant volume heat capacity of the calorimeter and I can get the internal energy change. Now, this is your bomb calorimeter. Of course, you realize that we have a stirrer to ensure uniform distribution of, the, of heat in the water jacket. And of course, we need a thermometer. Okay, now this device you should be able to sketch it, do a basic sketch, not a highly professional sketch, but at least a basic sketch and a description or indication of the importance of the various um, components. Now, we want to talk about another concept, enthalpy. All right, you, what you will find is that neither U, which is internal energy, or the change in internal energy is used a lot in chemistry. So we don't use internal energy a lot in chemistry. Why is that? Inter internal energy is determined under constant volume conditions. And the problem is that most reactions in chemistry and biochemistry and other areas occur not under constant volume conditions but under constant pressure conditions now the heat energy transfer that constant pressure is given a new name called enthalpy so the heat energy transfer that constant pressure is called enthalpy and it is signified by the letter h uppercase h Hence, heat change at constant pressure is called delta H. Heat change 
right? At constant pressure is called delta H, right? Change in enthalpy. Now, enthalpy change is a more useful parameter for assessing most chemical reactions. Why is that? Most chemical reactions occur at constant pressure and not constant volume. Now, delta H is clearly given by H final minus H initial, which is equal to Q at constant pressure. Because remember, the first line says heat energy transfer that constant pressure is called del is called a enthalpy or h right or i should say enthalpy which is symbolized by h so delta h is equal to heat at constant pressure that's what that's what enthalpy is that is what it is it is heat heat change or heat at constant pressure some people just say constant pressure heat okay now this is a very general and convenient way of describing it. If we start from the from the first law of thermodynamics, however, we find a more solid definition for enthalpy. Now enthalpy enthalpy change is equal to Q heat, which is heat at constant pressure. U, which is internal energy, is equal to Q at constant pressure minus PV, which is the same as or which can be rearranged to give Q is equal to U plus PV. So constant pressure heat, which is Q at, Q at constant pressure, is equal to U plus PV. Then what we can say is that enthalpy, which is H, is equal to the constant pressure heat, which is the same thing as saying the internal, uh, internal energy plus the effect of pressure and volume. Let's say that again. Let's say that again. A yeah, matter of fact, let's take it from up here. Now, delta H is equal to Q. Enthalpy change is equal to the constant pressure heat. Okay? Now, from the first law of thermodynamics, we know that U, which is internal energy, is equal to Q at constant pressure minus PV. Alright, if we take this equation here and rearrange it a little bit, what we get is Q at constant pressure is equal to U plus PV. Now, we know that heat, which is Q at constant pressure, is the same thing as enthalpy. Alright, so clearly, this is basically a triangular relationship. If Q at constant pressure is equal to delta H, but Q at constant pressure is also equal to U plus PV, then it is clear that H is equal to U plus PV. All right? So what we're saying is that enthalpy is the sum of the internal energy and the product of pressure and volume. That's all we're saying. That's what, that's what, that's what enthalpy is in a, in a very technical way. It is the internal energy plus the effect of pressure and volume. That's what H is. Okay? Now... Generally, we don't look at absolute values. We look at relative values. Relative is basically a comparison or a difference. We don't look at absolute values. Okay? We look at relative values. So, basically what I'm saying to you is that we generally don't look at enthalpy. Instead, what we look at is enthalpy change. We don't look at internal energy. Instead, uh, instead we look at internal energy change. Okay? Now, what I'm saying then is that we need to differentiate this equation. We need to differentiate this equation. Now, this is a little interesting way that I found that I probably could use to explain to you how to differentiate this equation. All right, to get a slightly different equation. Take, let's say, for example, you have a rectangle. This is your rectangle. The black lines represent your rectangle. Your rectangle has one side measuring a distance called P and the other side measuring a distance called V. Now, if you are going to expand your rectangle a little bit by differentiating it, let's say you expand the side called V by a little bit called 
dv or delta v. Let's say you also expand the side called p by a little bit called delta p. Alright, so p the side called p is a little bit longer now by a certain amount delta p. And the side called v is a little bit longer by a certain amount delta v. However, somebody come up to you and say, look, um, what is the overall size of this thing? Okay, what is the new size of it? Well, delta H is equal to, which is the change in H, is equal to delta U plus V delta P. So the new, the, 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 um, the new length, because what, what, what we want to find we want to find this new area, the new area of your rectangle. Okay? Now, V delta P. What is the area of this part? It is equal. Remember, how you find the, the area of a, of a rectangle? It is side times side. The length of this side is V. All right, this, this length here is the same length as up here. So the, the area of this part is V delta P. Here it is. The area of this part is what? Well, the length of this part is P. And here is delta V. All right? So it will be P delta V. What is the area of this little part here? It will be delta P delta V. All right? Which is the same as, so this entire equation can be summarized to mean delta H is equal to delta U plus delta VP. All right? Now, this is the equation for delta H when U, P, and V are all changing. Okay? If we keep pressure constant, if the pressure is not changing, then anything where you have a delta P will become zero. So this part here becomes zero and this part. Here it is. Anywhere you have pressure changing, that part will become zero because we said that the pressure is constant. There is no change in pressure. This part becomes zero. Hence, delta H is equal to delta U plus P delta V. All right? Therefore, delta U, of course, you could rearrange this expression. Rearrange it. All right, that's all I'm doing here. So we have delta U is equal to Q, which is the heat at constant pressure minus P delta V. Okay. Now, since delta H is equal to heat at constant pressure, all right, that's what delta H is equal to. Then, if we substitute these two equations into each other. What we have is this. Delta H is equal to Delta H is equal to heat at constant pressure. So delta H is really the constant pressure heat. And this is just us proving that delta H is equal to the constant pressure heat. That's all. Right? By substituting these two equations into each other. Wherever you have um you know, you have one thing, you basically substitute in another, and so they cancel out. Okay? Right. Now, it follows also that when V is constant, and the pressure varies, delta H is equal to delta U plus V delta P. Now, enthalpy of a substance will, of course, have some properties that are similar to those of internal energy because enthalpy actually comes from internal energy. Enthalpy, remember what enthalpy is? The enthalpy is the internal energy plus the effect of pressure and volume. Here it is. Enthalpy is equal to U plus PV. Enthalpy, however, includes the product of pressure and volume for a substance. And so it has added usefulness associated with the fact that it tracks changes in pressure and volume. Most processes in nature, and this is a fact, most processes in nature occur under constant pressure. And so enthalpy change um, processes are enthalpy changes of processes um, 
are very practical, are of very practical significance. In other words, they are way more useful than internal energy. But also, the good thing about enthalpy is that it takes in account internal energy plus the effect of pressure and volume. That's the usefulness of enthalpy. Now, what you could do is to go over this slide and see how this equation was differentiated using um, this little idea that I, I, I came up with after doing some observation. All right, after doing some observation. So you, you could just go back through this and to work through the proof and that will uh, build for you some significant strength. All right, students, so see you at the next lecture. Take care.